So um, I think we, I think everybody here has been to one of our meetings before at least. Um, so I won't bother with the introduction about our group, um, but welcome to everybody that's here so far. We'll probably get some more people joining us. Um, this month, we have joining us Carl Aldinger with the Sierra Club, and he'll be talking about sustainable transportation challenges. And just to let you know who we're having in the next few months, next month we'll be having Dorothy Wooten, the public health administrator of San Diego County. Hopefully you all know who Dorothy Wooten is. She talked to us on an ongoing basis about the COVID crisis. And she's going to be talking to us about the health aspects of climate change. And then tentatively scheduled for July, depending on his travel schedule, is the son of Dr. Keeling of Keeling's Curve. Um, he's, he also works at the Scripps Institute and he'll be talking about um, the current status of Keeling's Curve and um, give us some update information about the measurements and, and climate change. And then in September, we're going to have um, a local, another local, Rosalie Dito, who's going to talk to us about sustainable drought resistant gardening. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carl Aldinger, who's going to talk to us tonight. Go ahead, Carl. Thank you very much, Joy. Can y'all see that okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, I've been working at Sierra Club for three years now. Um, and one of the things that I'm tasked with is uh, learning about and helping to work uh, and organize our volunteers to work on sustainable transportation issues. Um, so I work with, uh, in coordination with other partner organizations and with our volunteers. Um, and we've got Dave Grubb on here tonight. Uh, is a, he's a volunteer with Sierra Club that I work with as well. So good to see you there, Dave. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background about uh, who I am. I do work for the Sierra Club, and I cover all of the, the San Diego and Imperial County region. Uh, I'm the only organizer that we have right now for the Sierra Club. We're a pretty thin staff of two and a half people. Um, so we're mostly volunteer run organization. And hopefully some of you um, are Sierra Club members on the side and you get to read what we're what we're doing through our newsletters. Um, before Sierra Club, I worked uh, as an organizer, a volunteer organizer with Sunrise Movement. And before that, I did work with uh, uh, SD 350. So I've been trying to work in, in climate for a long time. And uh, this has always interested me. How do we get our transportation converted over and transform it? Um, Something that you should know about me right up front, because I'm going to maybe challenge some notions that you might have about cars. Um, I am a car aficionado. My background is uh, working on cars. This is a picture of me with the, my 2007 Mini Cooper when the, uh, it dropped a valve and I had to go in and repair it myself. Um, the other picture is a BMW 2002, 1972 classic. So uh, I'm, I'm very much a lover of cars. And if electric cars were a clear uh, path to sustainable transportation alone, um, I would be the first person to tell you that. But unfortunately, um, we may have to challenge that notion a little bit tonight. And so I hope you'll bear with me. I hope that you'll keep an open mind um, and listen to some of the things that I have to say, because uh, we really need folks to be thinking more long-term uh, on what we're gonna have to do to, to get sustainable transportation under zero carbon, which is a, the topic. Uh, tonight. So first I'm going to cover sustainability. And I'm going to cover something you might have heard of. Um, it's called life cycle assessment. 
And so it's a way of trying to understand the sustainability of a product, something that you create and use and stop using. And then I'm also going to cover mode shift. Now, I'm hoping to do a, a series of sustainability, uh, sustainable transportation talks with Sierra Club uh, this coming year. So really, today is a primer uh, to try to get you some background and hopefully invite you to think more deeply about this. And I'm hoping that some of you all will come and join us over there at the Sierra Club presentations, uh, where we'll go deeper into the various aspects of sustainable transportation. There's way too much to cover in one, one presentation alone, but tonight we're gonna scratch the surface uh, and hopefully, like I said, talk to you about some things that you may not have uh, thought about before with sustainable transportation. So we know that uh, transportation makes up a big portion of our emissions. Mike Bullock is, uh, Mike Bullock is probably grimacing right now because uh, this number, when we described transportation has taken 38%, um, of our total California emissions. Uh, the next slide I have here says, oh, it's 36.8. This is a roving number, uh, constantly moving, usually uh, decreasing, but sometimes it's increasing because we're decreasing other forms of emission and the, the leftover uh, emission percentage-wise of transportation is growing because we're not addressing it quickly enough. Uh, a lot of the estimates about transportation emissions also include the fuel that we refine here in California, rightfully so. So those get counted as industrial uh, emissions. You'll see that up in the top corner of this slide, refinery 7%, and then there's the transportation of the fuels. So uh, some estimates are that it, it represents 50% of our transportation in the state. So transportation is a huge problem. Uh, we may be addressing our electrical grid with renewable energy in a great responsible way, but um, it means that we still have to focus on some of the other places where we haven't done the work yet. All right, so um, first thing, I, I don't think I have to tell folks here because this is uh, Fallbrook Climate Action Team that fossil fuels are unsustainable, but I, I do wanna uh, start with that premise that um, because we, we have a limited amount of fossil fuels and because we know how bad they are for the climate, uh, we really can't continue to, to use them. And so any transportation strategies that we have that are based on you know, high efficiency use of the same fossil fuels is really not sustainable. And I think it's important to just name that right up front. Um, we've got folks that are trying to deal with renewable uh, biodiesels uh, and, and other strategies for creating biofuels. Um, but the reality is this is not the way things are going for sustainable trans transportation. Um, instead, where sustainable transportation power is going to come from, it's going to come from the sun. Um, and we're going to use renewable energy um, and uh, hydroelectric energy to, to power vehicles in the future. Um, again, trying to, trying to think ahead about 2050 when we're to zero carbon. Uh, we really don't want to be messing around with trying to grow crops um, and and burn them. It, it's a it's a pretty bad strategy if we're trying to lower emissions. So using these renewable strategies uh, as our fuel source is sustainable. So that means we're going to focus on electrification. Um, all right, now I want you to close your eyes for a moment here. And I'd like you to think of what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I use the phrase sustainable transportation? What do you think of? Um, if you had to name something in your head, uh, what does that picture of sustainable transportation look like? So for many of us, um, sustainable transportation, uh, the iconic piece of sustainable transportation here in the United States has been the Toyota Prius. These are four generations of the Prius. Um, there's a fifth one now that's not in this picture. Um, and this was a good start of people starting to think, okay, I, I need to really focus on fuel economy. Um, I need to really get more bang out of my, my buck and out of my uh, emissions by really maximizing how efficient a car can be. Um, and so that, this was a good strategy. Unfortunately, it was one that was built entirely off of continuing to use fossil fuels. Um, now, the last one, the one that's in red, that's a prime. 
And so that's a plug-in hybrid. And uh, you can plug that in. And if you can uh, keep your, your driving down to a minimum, you can use that 100% on electric and just use the, the gas engine for backup or for when you're doing that long trip. Uh, a different kind of vision that's coming into many people's minds, especially since you see so many of these cars on the streets nowadays, is a Tesla. Um, Tesla definitely popularized the idea of a battery electric car being something that people could actually live with. Um, they did this with a very interesting strategy to go with uh, you know, a car that could perform like a Porsche and hold seven people. The, the original Tesla Model S, there were two jump seats in the back, um, and you could fit you know, family of seven. Uh, so it sounded like a dream and, uh, it got great rave reviews when it came out. Um, and so lots of, lots of good intentions when this car was produced so that we could get people to really find ways to migrate away from gas cars and start to use what, what, what was considered to be a very non-compromised electric vehicle. You've probably seen pictures of this before. This is, uh, the Solar de Atacama, uh, there's a lithium triangle in Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia. And this was our primary source of lithium for many years. Um, now it represents about a third of the lithium that's being used for industrial purposes, including for, for batteries for anything from an e-bike uh, and an e-scooter and an e-kick scooter all the way up to a Ford F-150 Lightning. Uh, that might have 135 kilowatt hour battery. Um, the process that they use to get this lithium is they extract water from deep beneath the ground uh, and that water has the salts, the lithium salts in it, and they use the sun to evaporate the water down. And they keep exchanging it from one pond to another. Eventually they get to about a 6% concentration of lithium in the water. And at that point they they put it in trucks and they ship it off to a refinery to get the rest of the uh, a refining process to get the rest of the lithium distilled down to uh, industrial grade lithium. So that's brine and it's well extraction. Um, this is an image of the Green Bushes mine in Western Australia. And this is using sp spodumene ore. So uh, you're actually pulling hard rock out of the earth and you're refining that. So you take it away, with, you, you blast it or uh, dig with big earth movers, um, haul it out with huge dump trucks. Um, we've all seen pictures of what mining operations look like. They're pretty dirty places right now. There's hope that someday they can electrify them. Um, but right now it's a big part of the emissions that goes into um, making any electric vehicle. Um, we shifted to spodumene ore as a primary source of lithium when the Chinese auto market started to really pick up uh, and the increased demand for lithium meant that there was um, now a need for new mining operations. And so Argentina, I'm uh, sorry, excuse me, um, Australia and China became major sources for lithium at that point. Now, one thing that I noticed when I was reading one of the many papers that I've read on the subject is that the spodumene ore uh, method of production for lithium has 10 times the emissions that the old style of brine extraction did. Um, so that's a real problem because many of the papers that we wrote originally on the impacts of electric cars were written with the knowledge that lithium had a given amount of emissions, and that was from the brine process. So sort of in the background, there's this moving state of play where we may be uh, getting some of our resources like the nickel manganese, um, copper, and the lithium from different sources. And as those change in how much emissions we have, we have to go back and rethink uh, what's the impacts of building these vehicles. All right. Um, the last thing that I want to try to cover in sustainability um, is something called the seventh generation principle. Uh, the Hot and Sunny conference was put together many years ago. Um, and I've got something here. If I could get a volunteer, it, I've found this to be pretty powerful. If, if somebody else uh, in the audience can read these words off, if if someone would like to volunteer, you could raise your hand. I'll call on you. Um, this is a, a interesting way of thinking of things, and I think it's really important to help frame the discussion. Anyone interested in helping out? 
Oh, I could read it. Okay, Bill, thank you. In all of your deliberations in the Confederate Council, in your efforts at lawmaking, in all your official acts, self-interest shall be cast into oblivion. Look and listen for the welfare of the whole people and have always in view, not only the past and present, but also the coming generations, even those whose faces are yet beneath the surface of the ground, the unborn of the future nation. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I hope that grounds us a little bit in trying to think not in terms of what do I need today um, to replace my gas car and do the same things that I've done uh, every other day in my life. Um, and instead, maybe we need to think more deeply about what these transportation solutions are that we're trying to come up with. Um, I can tell you one of the most difficult things in my, in my view that we'll have to face in the future may be to explain to all the folks that we drafted into becoming electric vehicle owners that we now need to rethink this idea of using electric vehicles. So we might wanna rethink it before we get in that situation where everyone's trying to operate an electric vehicle and we realize it may not be sustainable. Okay, so we're going to move on to life cycle assessment. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard of this before, but I'll cover a little bit about why we do life cycle assessment. Um, first of all, I should point out that life cycle assessment is usually trying to understand more than just CO2 equivalent emissions. So at, from a climate aspect, we care much, much about that. But life cycle assessment also takes into account uh, what kind of other pollutions that a product might put into the environment. Um, so it is a science in itself, and there, uh, there's a whole field of people that are doing these life cycle assessments on things. And this really helps people that are manufacturers um, or people that are regulators to try to have a better sense of what's going on with the uh, production of these, these things. And this is sort of new. Um, I'm sure that there have for many years been people who have thought in terms of that can't last forever. You know, we can't keep doing that. Uh, but this puts it into a scientific framework where you can actually um, try to quantify exactly how much emissions you have for each step of the way. So when I say step of the way, we see on this diagram, there's raw material extraction and then transportation to the material processing uh, factory. Then there's more transportation to the parts manufacturing factory. Then there's more transportation to the assembly factory. And then there's more transportation to the product use. So your, your final destination of the retailer. Um, and they may use it for uh, maybe 12 to 16 years in the case of an electric vehicle, best case scenario. Um, maybe, maybe longer, um, but also maybe shorter if somebody get, gets in an accident and totals their vehicle early. Um, and then finally, there's transportation to end of life. Um, and interestingly, when we're doing life cycle assessment on electric cars, there's a lot of benefits to recycling uh, the parts of a car. Uh, the steel for many years has already been uh, recycled. The lithium batteries for sure have a lot of value uh, in recycling them. So I don't want anyone here to think that there's uh, no efforts being made to recycle lithium batteries and that they're going to the landfill. That is definitely not happening. Um, but when we do life cycle assessment, we actually give some, some bonus points, some credit back to the uh, life cycle of a product if the materials that are given up during recycling end up uh, resulting in less extraction of new materials for the next product. Okay, um, last summer, the California Air Resources Board was going through their scoping plan. And during one of their meetings on transportation, I noticed some phrasing going on that really alarmed me. Um, and so I wanted to point it out to you folks here. You may not have heard of this before. And I think it's an important notion for us to think about when we're talking about sustainable transportation. <clears throat> that is, uh, the IPCC says we must not use LCA. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is the folks at CARB have to say explicitly in their CARB scoping plan, um, life cycle inventories are inconsistent with IPC standards as they would result in double counting of emissions across jurisdictions. Okay, so in layman's terms, what this means is, for example, if we produce an electric car entirely in another country, I'll, I'll use China as an example. 
And then we imported that car to the United States to Fallbrook. Um, because the IPCC says those emissions on the production of the car happened in China, they get counted in China. Um, and, and that's perfectly reasonable. We do need every country to be responsible for how much emissions are caused through industrial processes. Um, but what happens when we do that is we may fall completely blind to how much emissions were involved in the production of the goods that we use. And so we may need to find a hybrid way of trying to understand and always keep in mind what the impacts are of the things that we buy and how they impact our environment locally um, or on the other side of the planet, because this is a shared planet and this is a shared goal to remove, remove our uh, emissions. Now, many of you are probably thinking, well, we just passed the IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and that is asking for us to do domestic manufacturing of vehicles here in the United States. That's true, and that's a good thing. Uh, we should be responsible for the materials that we're using to create these vehicles. It'll help us. It'll help remind us of how much industrial emissions there are in the process. If we were to always do it remotely, we may fall um, short of understanding what the Im impacts are. But I can tell you from having listened to podcasts um, where, where folks are thinking about this always, uh, they're alarmed, they're scared, because they think that uh, you have no idea what the environmental movement is going to do uh, when you try to spring up all these new mines to create nickel mining and lithium mining here in the United States. It's going to cause a lot of barriers. There's going to be a lot of uh, you know, struggle to figure out what kind of mining is necessary and should we do it. Um, and so it's important that we're doing it. We, we can't make it somebody else's problem to carry the burden of the extraction, but this brings it to the forefront. We'll have to really consider, is it worth doing the extraction or are there other ways to accomplish our transportation? Right, um, another part of life cycle assessment is coming up with a model. How are you going to um, be consistent in all the calculations you're doing for your product? And something that Argon National Labs created so that people could help assess their products in the automotive industry um, better is they created this Greenhouse Gases Regulated Emissions and Energy in Transportation Model, or GREET. Um, there's two parts to GREET, GREET 1 and GREET 2. GREET 1 is the, uh, the fuel cycle, and then GREET 2 is to help model the impacts of producing the vehicles themselves. I've taken this uh, image from a lecture from uh, Dr. Alyssa Ken Kendall in, at UC Davis, and she gave a seminar on a paper that uh, she was working on with some others. Um, and it's a very interesting graph because this helps us really understand the life cycle assessment of the vehicle, various vehicles that we're talking about. Uh, oftentimes we try to compare one vehicle against another. And if we can get a big benefit, especially in the tailpipe emissions, we consider that a win. Um, that may be very important if your goal is to just reduce emissions. But if we're talking about getting to zero emissions, um, it's important to really understand what kind of quantity are we talking about here of emissions over the life cycle um, of, an, of a vehicle. So as we study this uh, graph, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this because it's a really important graph, um, again, done by a uh, respected researcher. This is not by a, a blogger who's trying to guess at this. This is, uh, this is what Dr. Kendall does. She does the life cycle assessment in a lot of different um, arenas, but uh, they chose to do this about electric vehicles. And she's since come up with a couple of other concepts and theories about ways that we should really be thoughtful about uh, the future of transportation. Uh, so we see across the top, there's uh, two industry, uh, sorry, internal combustion engines. Then we see a Prius, um, and that's not a plug-in hybrid. That's a standard hybrid that is run only on gas, but uses the electric motor to uh, re re use the, the um, inertia of the car to recharge the battery, and then it uses the battery to, to use the electric motor to move things. So that's a standard hybrid. And then there's a LEAF from 2012. And the reason why uh, she wanted to highlight that is we had very small battery cars uh, in 2012 when we created the LEAF, and it was very limited in how much it could do. Um, the next set is the Chevy Bolt that's described as the, uh, yeah, the EOV, 
I put the uh, the words of the the representative cars in there myself because the paper referenced them directly, but this chart did not. Okay. So I needed to add those. Um, then there's the PLS. That's a Tesla Model S, um, and the P stands for uh, performance luxury sedan. Um, and then there's a Tesla Model X, and that's a performance SUV. Um, and so what you notice when you look at these graphs, uh, let's look at the yellow lines first. This is what would happen if you use these um, in 2020 uh, with the United States average electrical grid. And what we can see is uh, the LEAF did pretty well. Um, the Bolt did even better. Um, the, the Prius did pretty good. And if you track the green line down, the Prius did just about as well uh, as the Tesla Model S and the Tesla Model X. And that's because uh, our national grid is still pretty dirty. Um, if you look just at the production of the car and the production of the battery, um, those electric vehicles are okay, but they, they have much more production emissions. Uh, the, the blue parts um, are pretty large, and that's because those vehicles uh, were the first to include very large batteries. Uh, 75 kilowatt hours, 85 kilowatt hours, 95 kilowatt hours, and 100 kilowatt hours um, were the size batteries that we were starting to use in Teslas. And now we're starting to see this to be pretty common, especially in the, the pickup trucks and the SUVs. Um, so the reason why Dr. Kendall wanted to spot like this, and I should also point out that the diamonds on the graph are representative of the California um, grid. So if you operate these cars, in the California grid, you can stop right where those diamonds are. And that shows that electric vehicles with a much cleaner grid are in much better shape. Um, so that's important. Um, the remainder of the, of the graph goes into more details about um, some guesses about how we will get better at electric battery production. But also um, she made some predictions about long range vehicles and people put trying to strap batteries on that would help them go 600 miles. Um, and that's not an impossible thing to guess because we've seen plenty of people um, in that space really seeking out to go farther and farther distances, um, which can really compromise the sustainability of these cars. You know, we get to 2025 and the sustainability um, is increasing as these yellow line, yellow bars are shrinking. But if we put the long range batteries back on them to make things even better for ourselves, uh, we can make the 2025 long range performance SUV even worse than the Prius. Um, so that's really important to understand. And also it's a really important to note that this graph is showing grams of CO2E per mile, um, which is hard for us to understand. How many tons of, of carbon is that over the lifetime? Well, it depends on how many miles you've driven the cars. And so we'll see that in more talk about LCAs. All right, using that um, GREET model, there's another uh, website put together by folks at MIT, and they've taken the GREET model and they've turned it into something called the carbon counter. And using the carbon counter, you can go in and dial in different cars and figure out what's the life cycle assessment of various cars, both internal combustion engine cars and electric vehicles. Um, so here I've, I've chosen cars to put on my graph. Um, there's the mini electric, the Polestar 2, the Volvo C40, which is a, a pretty close cousin to the Polestar. And then uh, for reference, there's a Volvo XC40, which is very similar to the C40 Recharge, except it's an internal combustion engine car. Um, what I want you to notice on these graphs is the, the blue numbers at the bottom of the Polestar and the Volvo. You see 38, 39, and 38.4, and 39. And this is the production of those cars, both the battery and then the what they call the roller. We'll, we'll take those numbers, combine them together. We get about 77 grams um, CO2E per mile. Sorry, this is getting a little bit technical, but I wanted to show my work. Um, and finally, we multiply that by what the MIT model uses as the average uh, life vehicle mileage which is 169,400 miles. I know that sounds like a, a very specific number that doesn't sound rounded off. Uh, that's because they tried to use a, a national average when they, uh, when they chose that. So you get 13 tons of production emissions for both the Polestar 
and the Volvo, give or take 13.1 tons for the Volvo electric vehicle. Um, so this is the lifetime production um, emissions. It doesn't count the, uh, the usage. And if you were to power it 100% with renewable energy, you might be able to stick pretty close to these numbers. There's still maintenance, there's still tires, uh, but overall this, this would count for uh, a majority of the impact if you used it totally on renewable energy. Well, in 2020 and in 2021, Polestar actually went out uh, and they were the first company to my knowledge to, to um, actually give witness to an actual number for how many tons of emissions their vehicles had in production. Polestar did it first and then their sister company Volvo did it. Um, this is the graph that they showed for the Polestar and it really floored me because I was familiar with the kind of numbers that people had been talking about for years. I read the Union of Concerned Scientists um, information about electric vehicles and they would usually quote uh, cars having about 10 tons of production uh, emissions. But here we're talking about two EVs with fairly large range and uh, that happened to be built in China at a new lead factory in China that's powered entirely off of renewable energy. And Polestar is a company that only builds electric. Uh, so they care very much about their impact. That's why they created this report. And what they had to show was that the Polestar 2 long range dual motor, so that's kind of their worst case scenario. It's got the biggest battery and it's using two motors to make it higher performance. Plus it gives you four wheel drive if you happen to live in a snowy environment. Um, when that car is operated on wholly renewable energy, uh, which is possible in some place like Finland um, or Norway, you you get a total of uh, 27 tons. Uh, and that includes a little bit of the use space because even renewable energy has some impact on emissions. Uh, we don't get solar and wind from nowhere. There's emis emissions in creating and continually operating those things. Um, but it's 27 tons. Um, and this also does include the end of life. But as I said, end of life oftentimes ends up becoming a, a plus for your impact, not a minus. Uh, or, or the other way of looking at it is uh, it helps your impacts to recycle something. So end of life is not a big uh, a big fa uh, factor in electric vehicles. But what floored me is this 27 or let's call it 26 for the sake of argument to get rid of that last piece of orange there. That's 26 tons compared to what Greet tells us is 13 tons. And that means that we've misestimated by using a generalized model um, what the impacts were for this vehicle. Now, who's right? I would guess that um, Volvo is, and, and Polestar are probably closer to right because they commissioned their own exploration into their impacts. And they certainly don't want to admit any more impacts than they need to. Um, their goal is to get to zero. Um, and so they did this work to try to figure out how far off from zero they were. Um, but it's pretty scary to see that it was twice the impact for production as what uh, for example, the Greek generalized model tells us those cars have. I'm bringing that to your attention because um, there are not a lot of other cars companies that have actually published their, their modeling. I, I've looked in the Tesla report. They do show it uh, in grams per CO2 uh, per mile, grams of CO2 E per mile, but they show it on a graph that has no uh, data labeling of the exact data figure. Um, and they're a little bit fuzzy about how many miles you're actually going to get out of the car when they publish the figures. So they're getting better, um, but most companies do not actually publish these figures. Uh, I noticed that Kia did it for the EV6. They got a lot of press for uh, bragging to everybody that they had the first LCA done by a, a third-party standard carbon tracker. Um, and when I went to look what the answer was, what, what was the total carbon emissions of the car? Um, the answer was not published. And so I reached out to a carbon uh, tracker who helped them uh, come up with a figure. And they said, well, it's up to the car company to publish that figure. Um, it's, it's not up to us to publish it. So unfortunately, Kia did this for their EV6 and they weren't maybe very proud of the number and they chose not to publish it, even though they chose to tell everybody in the press that they had figured out what it is. They just weren't willing to tell everybody what it was. Right. I want to focus a little bit on what our Per capita CO2 emissions are currently, 
um, and then I want to um, project a little bit forward into the future. So this graph taken from our world in data um, is, is showing some pretty generic uh, summary information about the average per capita emissions of various countries. These are countries that I chose. They're not the highest. Um, some of the Emirates countries are the highest because they have a low population, but they're um, they're pulling oil out of the ground, so they get really high high quantities per capita. But I did want to spotlight on here that the United States is 14.86 tons per year. That's our average. Now that's not representative of every, of every single person because some people live in a city, they don't own a car, um, and so and they may live in an apartment. Uh, they may have a much lower footprint than somebody that lives in a very big home. Um, and that drives a, a, a car that, with a lot of emissions, for example, a lot of ways that we, um, or, or maybe somebody flies a lot. Um, and these emissions are our entire country's emissions. So if our country is one that does a lot of industry and then exports it, doesn't matter. We get, we get to feel that impact on a per capita basis on something like this. So if our military has high emissions, uh, that, that gets credited here too per, per capita. So our current is 14.86. And I want you to notice here the world current average is 4.69. Um, so this data was as of 2021. Um, so that means that we're we're much higher than the world average. Um, we're much higher than most of the industrialized nations. That's kind of what I tried to focus on here. Um, and we have a long way to go as far as lowering our emissions. So when we're trying to understand what's the impact of, of operating or buying an electric vehicle, it's important to understand it relative to this. And then what I need to tell you is by 2050, the expectation is that our global average per capita is two tons of carbon per year. Um, somebody would say it was zero, or we're trying for zero carbon, but there is a certain amount of carbon that is drawn down um, from, the, uh, from the air, from our emissions, uh, drawn down by natural means. So uh, that's the current estimate is about two tons per person globally in 2050. Um, so I want you to think about that, that pole star being 25 or 27 tons. Um, that's a lot of your carbon budget to use on purchasing a car. And so the car company's hope is that we can chase that um, emissions from production way down and the emissions from use way down. And their hope is that by 2030, you know, we'll be there. That's what Polestar's goal is. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. What Polestar had to admit when they did their second uh, audit was, it's our suppliers that are killing us. We did everything right, you know, at our production facilities, but we didn't really police our our producers of of our supplies. Um, and as much as they want to police them, there's still only you know limits to how much you can do if, if the mining. It uses big earth movers and there's no electrical uh, process to do that, uh, then you're in trouble. Or some of these, uh, or refinement produ uh, production processes use a lot of industrial heat. So uh, we're still using fossils, unfortunately, in a lot of this production. All right, I'm gonna switch to a bicycle for a second because uh, for the first time uh, in 2020, Trek, who is a, a large bicycle company. They make a lot of different types of bicycles and they're renowned for making high quality bicycles. They're not a fly by night bicycle company the way we've seen with a lot of these e-bike companies that have sprung up from nowhere. Um, Trek is a big enough company. They decided to do an impact report. They, they, they have shareholders and they want to make sure that, I think they have shareholders. They want to make sure they're doing the right thing and they wanted to understand what are our carbon emissions and how can we get a hold of them um, and start to get them down. And so uh, this is a very busy graph, but it's a very, very interesting one if you ever get a chance to look at Trek's uh, impact report from 2020. Um, and what this shows, the multicolored bands on this is showing for each of their bicycles, they broke down what each individual part, what the emissions were uh, attributable to on the whole of that bike. So you get to see interesting things. I'm gonna switch to um, a, a specific bike. This is their electric bike called a rail at the time is a mountain bike. And this mountain bike um, has the breakdown. Not everything is shown uh, in the details on this graph, but they did account for all the things. And so we can see that the impact of creating this electric bicycle is about a quarter ton of CO2 as compared to 25 or 27 tons, or maybe 13 tons, depending on who's accounting 
you're using for an electric vehicle. Um, this is a quarter ton for an electric bicycle. Um, and so this includes them shipping the parts around the world, them getting this thing to their distri distribution centers and finally out to the retailer and getting it in people's hands. Um, but they, they attribute all of the different parts and what it takes to get there. Uh, what's interesting about this graph is something like the, um, you know, you would think that the battery has the biggest impact and the motor has the second biggest impact. Well, the, the motor had 8% impact. The battery had 15% impact. And the fork assembly, this part up on the front of the bicycle that, supp that supplies suspension to the bike, that has 16%. So it's good that they do this audit. <laughs> they, they can suddenly realize that it's something that may not be necessary to have on all of their bikes actually has a pretty big, big impact, bigger than the battery. Um, so this is important that we're able to do this kind of work across all of the different modes of transportation. Uh, when we do this for rail, it's going to be very tricky because we'll have to take into consideration what about all those railroad lines that we have to put in for rail? What about all the catenary lines that we have to stretch across and the maintenance on all of that stuff? Okay, so we're, we're moving out of life cycle assessment and I appreciate y'all uh, bearing with me as I went into that mathematical detail, but it was important for us to kind of scratch the surface of why life cycle assessment is necessary. Um, now I wanna talk about mode shift. So here we're talking specifically in some cases about walking, biking, transit. Right, here's a graph again from our world in data. Um, and this is actually in, in Britain. They're using British data here. So uh, bear in mind, this is in kilometers. Um, when they're talking about their bus there, that is a, a diesel bus. Um, and down towards the bottom, we see national rail in the purple. Um, and we see Eurostar. And those two are, are run on electric. So you can see, and this is a graph in passenger uh, impact. So it's pass, it's a CO2 equivalent per passenger kilometer. And so what that means is if you load a bunch of people up on the Eurostar, your impact is very low. Uh, that's, the, that's the best way to move people long distance is with electric rail. Um, specifically, the Eurostar is run off of uh, what we consider to be carbon-free uh, electricity that's run off of the, the nuclear grid in France. Um, another thing that's important to note from this graph, if you look at the blue line that's four down from the top, it reads 192 grams. That's a medium car uh, and petrol, which is gasoline. Um, and then if you go down to the green bar, uh, I guess seven up from the bottom, you'll see that says petrol car, two passengers. And what that's hoping to represent to you is that if you put a second person in that car and you were intending to make the same trip, um, carpooling halves your impact for the day. So it's very important to understand some of these large vehicles, if they were loaded up with seven people, uh, the way that they, they uh, commit to being, you know, you can build an SUV for three, three passenger rows, but if you're only driving around as a single person, your impact is not really helping. You need to load those cars up to make them useful in that way. This is an image of 48 people uh, and the kind of congestion that we create in our moving spaces, our, our highways or our cities or anywhere. Um, you guys know that the signal that they put in at Green Canyon, the road that I live off of, has really mucked up uh, traffic miserably at rush hour now. Sometimes traffic's backed all the way up to Daniel's Market um, just because we got a bad signal timing. And that signal, unfortunately, is really messing things up. Um, but so on the left here, we have 48 people uh, in a bus. That's how much space it takes to move 48 people. Um, in the center, you have those same 48 people next to the bicycles that it would, it would represent for them to ride through, the, through this uh, city space or maybe a suburban space. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have the, their 48 cars or SUVs. And so you can see just from this visual, um, there's a lot more stuff moving around when we all drive in individual vehicles. If we all chose to, uh, and we had a good transit system that could get us to where we need to go in a responsive amount of time, um, the better way to go seems pretty obvious looking at this uh, is to go with the low impact bikes or to go with the, the bus. And that should be an electric bus, by the way. Um, all right, um, I'm showing this image just to give an example of what it might look like 
if you are asked to travel by bicycle or walk in a space that kind of cordons off some of our transportation spaces for active transportation. Um, you see everybody here is pretty chill, right? They're not worried about whether there's a, a tractor trailer bearing down on them because this is not a space they have to share with cars at all. Um, so this is a dream for a lot of uh, urban and, and possibly suburban planners to think of ways that we can have some separate, separate infrastructure for people to safely ride their bikes. Um, one of the biggest factors for people when they're asked, would you ride a bike uh, to help with the climate? Uh, their usual response for many people is, if it was safe, I would do it. Um, and that's a perfectly understandable apprehension to have. It feels very unsafe. Um, you all know that we don't have a lot of bike lanes in Fallbrook. I, I know of one on Fallbrook Street. Um, we just don't have a lot. Um, and so, you know, people see me riding along the side of Mission and they think that, you know, I've got a screw loose that I would be riding next to 50 mile per hour traffic. Um, I've just grown up around bicycles, so I'm not real timid about it, but I understand that not everybody is comfortable doing that yet. And so it, it calls for the need for us to create better bike infrastructure um, and more walkable spaces too, so that it's easy to walk. Uh, if you try to cross Main Street in Fallbrook, you realize there are not a lot of cr crosswalks. Um, and so if you're up by, um, let's see, by grocery outlet, um, and you're trying to cut across the street, there's no, there's no crosswalk. And so I see people there all the time trying to make that, uh, that cross with no crosswalk. Um, in, 20, in 2023, January 2023, um, new law went into effect. There is no longer a jaylock, jay, uh, jaywalking law in California. So if you see someone uh, ripping across the street and they're not at a crosswalk, you should know that they're in the right. They have the, the uh, right to do that. Um, they need to do it safely and they're supposed to do it responsibly. But the, we've removed the jaywalking laws. And it's kind of important because a lot of places we have not left the right crosswalks for people to be able to get from one place to another on foot. Right, when I talk about uh, moving to bicycle, sometimes I'm, I'm talking to retirees, sometimes I'm talking to people um, who haven't been on a bicycle since they were 15 years old. Um, and what I found that was really interesting when I got my first recumbent trike uh, was to find out that there's an entire uh, new cohort of people who have gotten past uh, an age where they feel comfortable being on an upright bike, but they feel great about being on a recumbent bike. It's got three wheels and it makes things a lot more stable. And so I'm pointing this out because I want to show that the, where we may feel like there's limitations, I could never get on a bicycle. Um, that's not always the case, uh, but it, understandable that not everybody feels like it's, this is for them. Uh, so this is an example of somebody riding a recumbent bike with fat tires in the snow. Um, this is a gentleman named Paul Fogarty out of uh, England. Uh, he was born with no arms and one leg. And uh, Paul had his trike adapted to him so that he can pedal with uh, one good leg and one leg where he wears a prosthetic and he steers with his, arm, uh, with his shoulders. Um, now this is an e-bike, but Paul covers 30, 35 and 40 miles by himself. So um, I want you to kind of keep this image in your mind of when people tell you that you, you can't ride a bicycle or when you convince yourself you can't ride a bicycle. I think if Paul can learn to ride a bicycle, there's a lot more of us that could be using uh, micro mobility and e-bikes uh, than we can actually imagine. Um, one more picture of folks with disabilities uh, who are riding bikes. These are uh, these are both hand bikes. Uh, the one on the left is a recumbent bike with two front wheels. Uh, sorry, two wheels in the front and one wheel in the rear. And the other is a hand bike, hand trike with two wheels in the rear and one in the front. Um, and these can be adapted to either be electric or be completely mechanical. All right, now I'm going to go through some of my own personal bikes. Uh, this is a bike that I bought in, in 2015. So it was an 11 year old bike. Um, it's not an e-bike, but I converted it to an e-bike. I stuck a motor on it. I stuck a battery on it. There's some controls up there by the handlebars. And you can see I've got it on the front of the 306 bus here. Um, this is a good example of how we could take something that's sitting in everyone's garages or many people's garages, that bicycle that was long forgotten, um, and we could adapt it to be electric. Um, I use this bike to commute from Fallbrook to Carlsbad. Uh, so that was 19 miles each way. Uh, and it took me an hour to go each way, but with traffic, that's about how long it took me to go in my car. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities that we could take advantage of if we think outside the box and start to embrace this idea of um, 
could we electrify other forms of transportation? Um, I have to tell you, I was not in good shape when I started doing this. In fact, I had no idea whether I would make it to the office with the bike that I built. Um, luckily, I did. And I got to tell you, it was the best shape that I was in for the for the time that I was doing it because I was exercising for two hours a day. And I don't know a lot of people that go to the gym for two hours a day. This is the trike that I uh, put together two years ago. Um, this, this trike was built as a, a racing trike in 2002. It's an Australian uh, trike, very rare. I think there's only uh, a few dozen of these in the world because it was built for racing. I managed to buy it used for $1,100 um, and I adapted, I restored it um, myself. And then I mostly, that just meant painting, right? And, and re-greasing things, but I replaced some parts and I put a, a motor on it and a battery. And so this is me riding that trike uh, from Fallbrook to the Sprouse and Vista. So that's about a, um, I guess about a nine, 10 mile ride for me. And this is that same trike uh, riding from Fallbrook to the Trader Joe's in Temecula. Um, now I'm not a long distance rider, I'm not an athlete, um, but I try to prove to myself that these are the things that we could do if we chose to do them. If we, if we decided this is the way that we have to go, uh, that micromobility is the way. We can, we can go great distances with these small electrified vehicles uh, without being an Olympic athlete, without being an athlete at all. Uh, it takes more time um, and it takes some dedication. But um, if I can go from Fallbrook to Temecula and back on one charge, um, there's plenty of opportunities for a lot more of us to try that. This is my trike uh, going on the coaster. Um, now, technically, a three-wheeler is not allowed on the coaster. I wish they would change that role because there's plenty of people that ride tricycles that could really use the benefit of taking their, uh, their bike on the train. Um, but at any rate, my trike barely fits on the train. It's a little longer than it should be, and it has uh, one more wheel than it should. Uh, but the engineers are always really gracious with me when I use my, uh, my electric bikes on our public transit here in San Diego. One of the other things I did uh, during COVID was I wanted to try a cargo bike out. I had never experienced an electric cargo bike before, but they're expensive. They can be three, four, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000. Not a cheap thing, but it's meant to be as a car replacement. Um, as, as you'll see in, in, in some photos, if you start researching electric cargo bikes. Um, why did I do this on CAD? Well, I was actually building the frame myself out of bamboo. So here's a picture of this electric cargo bike at the Target in Oceanside. Again, you know, these places seem like they're pretty out of reach for folks that live in Fallbrook. Um, but there are ways to do it with electric bikes. These things can get you far as long as you're willing to take the time to go there. My electric bike um, maxes out at around 20 miles per hour. Uh, the trike that I was showing you earlier, I can do about 35 miles per hour on that. Although technically I'm supposed to go about 28 miles per hour top speed. <clears throat> Here's a better view of that bike. Um, so it's made out of bamboo. Uh, the basket that I wove is made out of rattan. So this is a grass on grass bike. Um, and if you look down to where the pedals are, there's a motor back there. And in the belly of that basket um, are two batteries from uh, Chinese kick scooters. A company went out of business. And so I was able to pick up the used batteries to power this bike. Um, so this is a, a kind of extreme looking bike. Um, it's got that giant laundry basket on it. But the point of it is uh, you use this for utility. You can go shopping with this bike. Um, and so just the same way uh, an entire generation got excited about the hatchback, right? This idea of a compact car with a hatch that opened in the back. I think folks are going to get very excited about this idea of cargo bikes and the ability to be able to um, be going somewhere on your way and realize, oh, I need to stop at the shop and pick something up and not worry about whether or not you have a backpack. Of course, I have room on my big cargo bike to stick something in there. Um, so far, ironically, the, the biggest load that I've had in this bicycle is uh, four gallons of gasoline and a car battery. So, you know, again, I told you guys at the beginning, I'm a motorhead and the, the gasoline was so I could mow the backyard um, and the battery was so that I could get rid of a car. I needed to uh, change out a battery on it. Um, but, you know, I just want to give you guys ideas. There's lots of ways that we can electrify that don't involve the, the heavy impact of full electric vehicles. Um, last thing I want to um, show you a little bit here on, on the bike perspective is um, 
my electric bike, the trike here shows you 8.2 watt hours per mile. That's the electric efficiency. Now you're putting human impact into an electric bike as well as the motor pushing you. Um, but to put that in perspective, because that's a number that means almost nothing to most of us. Um, a Tesla Model 3, which gets a little over four um, miles per kilowatt hour, when you convert that to watt, watt hours per mile, it's about 239 watt hours per mile. Um, and so comparing that to my use of an electric bike, my e-bike's about 30 times more efficient with electricity. Um, and that can be important. If folks uh, are going out to buy their first electric car, and then they realize, oh, I should put some more solar panels on my roof because now suddenly I'm having to pay an electric bill again. Uh, you can come to realize that your electric car uh, uses more electricity than most of the other things at your house. And so this idea of us using micromobility uh, means that we'll put a lot less burden on our uh, ever-increasing renewable grid. It's going to be hard to build out in the first place. And the last thing we want to do is burden it with um, cars that are maybe larger than they need to be. Um, so I talked a lot about uh, bikes. Let me just touch on the fact that we need transit in our region. We have buses. Um, I thought forever that a bus is pretty inaccessible to me. The truth is, it's a mile walk for me to get to, to the bus. I can get to two bus stops within a mile. So I'm sort of between two different ones. Um, that's not a, a big hardship. I walk three miles a day just to get to get some exercise. So one mile is not too bad. I don't know how long it is for everybody else in Fallbrook. Um, but this idea that we don't have a transit system, that's not entirely true. What we don't have is a very responsive and a fast and an easy to use transit system. So we want to build it out. Um, we want it to look more like this picture here where you've got access to, um, to bicycles that you can then quickly um, you know, maybe bootstrap to your first mile. Uh, first 10 miles, uh, maybe first 12 miles for me to get to the Vista Transit Center, um, and then get on a train. And maybe you lock your bike up at the train station, or maybe you take your bike with you on the train. This is an image from um, a Sandag presentation uh, from the 2021 RTP cycle. Um, and they described this early on in their, their talks about things that they considered, but they dismissed. And that was to have um, commuter rail routes running all across the region. If you look at the blue line that's going down the middle, um, that's extending from Oceanside through Vista, through Carlsbad, um, and then down where it would start to maybe look like it was going to make a connection, but it still stayed centered on a whole new route. Um, and then you see the green and yellow line off to the right. Um, that's a section that we, where we don't have rail yet. That's expected to be our high speed rail eventually, um, but they could make reuse of that with regional rail so that people uh, from Temecula and Riverside can make their way down to San Diego using transit um, and vice versa. You know, those of us that live down here could maybe um, take transit to get up to there. I know probably a lot of you uh, drive your cars up to Temecula to do some of your shopping, some of your other things. Right, um, that kind of rounds out what I wanted to cover tonight. Um, again, this was a primer, so I hope that I touched on some things. I hope I sparked a little bit of controversy. I hope I, I hope I made you a little bit angry about something that I said, because my goal here is not to, uh, to show you how easy this transition is. It's to show you that we've got really strong challenges. Um, and I hope that I've given you some things to think about, about ways that we might operate a little bit differently. I don't mean to knock so badly on electric cars that y'all should feel bad about owning an electric car. Uh, my wife and I are in the process of buying our first electric car, finally. Um, and I recognize that's the times that we're in. Um, you can't be car free right now very easily. It's a very big hardship to not operate with a car, especially when you live in Fallbrook. Um, but I, th this talk is about how do we plan for the future and what types of um, things should we expect for the future and what types of things should we help push for in the future? Because if we're not really looking forward, we should expect that things are going to get more turbulent than they need to. And if we're very forward looking, uh, we can maybe come up with better solutions to make sure that we're um, preparing ourselves for the changes in the future. Um, I wanted to mention that I hope to do a, a full sustainable transportation series. So I'll cover some other topics. Tonight was just the basics of decarbonizing transportation. We can go into a lot more detail um, about the pros and cons of electric vehicles, for example, or 
um, the ins and outs of active transportation and e-bikes. Um, so there's a lot more to cover, and I hope that you'll uh, watch for me over at the Sierra Club side of things for that transportation series. Um, I have two calls of action to action that I'd like to share with you. Um, let's go uh, San Diego org or let's go sd.org um, is a new ballot initiative uh, that we tried uh, a year ago it we didn't get the petition uh, numbers that we needed but this is a concerted effort by folks in the sustainable uh, community that are looking forward to trying to promote a sales tax um, that would be used to fund sandag projects and um, so that would include transit projects and um, bicycle infrastructure, for example. Um, the second call to action is um, there is grant money out there for electric school bus grants. Um, and I happen to notice that um, because Fallbrook and Bonzel are considered rural, and because we've got enough low income folks uh, at those two schools, um, those two schools are on the priority list for grants for electric school buses. So um, if any of y'all would be interested in helping me contact and work with uh, the school districts and maybe the contractors of the bus services um, that they contract with, we could work at trying to get them some grant money so that they could replace a diesel bus with an electric bus. Um, some of the other schools that have done this have gotten a number of their buses replaced under that program. Uh, and it's a good stepping stone. Once they get their first charger in and their first electric bus and they get their bus drivers learning how to use them, they can become a lot more comfortable and start to look forward to the idea of decarbonizing their bus system. All right, uh, that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. And I, I hope we got to the point where there's some questions or maybe some discussion that we could have. So we're running a little over, but let's um, see if anybody wants to ask a few questions. And I'm also happy to um, okay, go ahead, Glenn. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, contact information for you, Carl. Yeah, I'll send that out to Joy and hopefully she can send. Joy, do you, do you usually send a follow up email after one of your presentations? Um, we do send a no, notice once yeah. the video is ready. Okay. Yeah, I'll put together a little packet so that I can give you guys my contact information and some more information about the, the two calls to action. Okay, okay, thank okay, you. Okay, I'll forward yeah. that to Bill when you send it to me. Mike, did you have a question? You're muted, yeah, Mike. Yeah, I did. Yeah, Carl, I, I love your presentation. It uh, really helped me uh, learn how to talk about these things uh, and to think about them and all the data. And uh, I really like the, the bicycles. Um, I'm not much of a mechanic. I do a little bit, but uh, it's just amazing uh, what you've accomplished there. I, I think you're quite the mechanic. Um, now, in terms of how I look at this, I think that 2030, is everything. We live or die by 2030. And um, it is important to know where we're starting from, but it's really important to know um, what do all those numbers that you are talking about, what do they look like in 2030? I, I know we need our um, electricity be at least 85% renewable. And you know, right now we're 35% and, and you went back a few years that number is getting bigger. And also I'm throwing out these numbers and it's really sort of California, Southern California. I'm not sure where, what the electricity is in the, in the, in the factories you're talking about. And then they're not even, they're not even using electricity. That's the other thing we have to do. We have to really electrify everything. And you, a lot of your numbers are reflecting current conditions or maybe even a few years back when, you know, it's fossil fuel. That's what they're using. Great big caterpillars and everything. All that stuff can be electrified. I mean, if they can electrify these big trucks, I guess they can electrify anything, but it's not there yet. It's not there. And so what you're talking about is what's happening now. Uh, my work is almost like 2030 is the only year that matters, you know, because that is the first climate stabilizing requirement we have. You know, 2045, I think you said 2050, but it, you know, it's about the same net zero, that's, that's true. But we may destabilize the climate before we get there. I appreciate that, Mike. One of, 
One of the things that I pulled out of the presentation for, for time, and I'm trying to um, pair down the amount of like uh, images and videos that I use in this presentation that are not with permission, because I want to do, do this um, on a larger scale and try to help share this with folks across Sierra Club. And in that case, we need to make sure that we cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's. But it was a video of uh, Elon Musk talking to Leonardo DiCaprio um, in a documentary. Uh, and some of you may remember that that scene. And, you know, Leo is really impressed by the fact that uh, a younger Elon Musk is telling him, we just need 100 of these gigafactories and we can uh, we can change the world. And that's very aspirational thinking. But what I want to share with you guys tonight is that um, we are already experiencing uh, lithium and nickel crunches uh, as far as can we get these things built uh, at, at the demand that we currently have, which is still only about 1%. And the answer is no, we're, we're experiencing uh, big fluctuations in prices because we don't have the mining to cover the, um, the material that we're, that we're gonna need. Now, we're hopeful that things like um, maybe extracting from um, underneath the Salton Sea, right? Um, if we can use those geothermal plants to pull brine up, um, and use nanoparticle filtering to just pull out the lithium and then return the brine right back down to the ground the way that geothermal had always done. We're hopeful that that could present a whole new way of extracting lithium. But I wanna go back to that concept of seventh generation and can we do that for a thousand years? Absolutely not. So, um, you know, there are lots of implications as to thinking in terms of, well, what can I get done this year or myself? And so I think that's where maybe Elon Musk had a little bit of too short-term thinking where he just thought, if we just build a hundred of these factories, I can, I can get this done. And not just him, but you know, he said, if, if we as a society choose to build a hundred of these factories globally, we can get this done. And that's true maybe for a, a month, but you soon realize that well, we also need the amount of extraction to, to match those factories. And then when you do that for five years, where are you? Do, you? do you look back and say, this is not sustainable? So I'm hoping that we um, take those projections with a grain of salt and really think differently about other ways. Dr. Tim. Thank you, Carl Aldinger. I really, really, really thought this was exceptional. And uh, I, I am a scientist at heart and go to all the SANDAG meetings. I uh, wanted to just mention two things that I think are going need to be integrated. I mean, Mike keeps uh, going all over the place telling us how we're behind the curve, which we are, but the technology is really changing fast. And uh, so I put uh, two links I came upon recently for sodium batteries. Um, which is, uh, uh, you know, probably will be, uh, they're lighter. I mean, they take up more space. And so maybe not, uh, 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 maybe not for the transportation industry, but I think we need to pay good attention and support with grants, uh, the newer technologies and not just for what people can make a uh, engineering profit right now. But again, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I follow, um, the electric car industry much more than I probably should. It takes uh, a ton of my time. I watch dozens of uh, podcasts. And so I, I do try to learn as much as I can about the state of affairs. Um, and yeah, we've seen uh, solid state got a lot of press and solid state batteries haven't really played out the way that folks had hoped that they would. Um, CATL does actually have some of those uh, sodium batteries um, in production now um, in a car, which everyone is shocked to see. Um, the big shift from lithium ion to lithium iron phosphates um, was more of a reflection of, damn, we don't have the nickel and the manganese that we thought we were going to have, so we need to shift to iron phosphate. Um, there, there are other benefits to going that route. They're a little cheaper. They're definitely more sustainable. Um, so that was a, a good move that we're moving towards lithium iron phosphate. But um, I want you to think of those not as necessarily um, engineering decisions that were meant for the best design. These were out of um, scrambling, you know, oh, we don't have the, the things that we need to build the batteries that we wanted to for our tech. Um, one of the things I noticed is uh, if you look right now at the state of affairs with Tesla, 
they are using batteries from multiple suppliers in multiple formats. And I don't think that was their original intention, um, but they're, they're trying to react to the restrictions that they have. So they had to start going to CATL for batteries in their Shanghai plant. Um, and, and they moved from uh, uh, cylindrical cells to prismatic cells, which they thought they would never do. Um, but they did it pretty quickly because they realized we have to do this or we can't keep our, our production up. So you're seeing the electric car and, and even the, um, the more traditional car manufacturers are scrambling for, are we going to be able to get this done in the time that it takes to get it done? And I know something that uh, Dave Grubb and I have talked about a lot in the past is there are severe limitations as to how much of this we can get done before we hit those uh, limits. That's why I really want to help focus people on some of the alternatives. Maybe we become a society in the short term where we go from two vehicle, two electric cars or two cars to one electric car and then a different form of transportation for the second person in the family. Just to mention one other thing, I, I get science and nature every week and I cannot keep up. There is so much going on, but uh, there are biological batteries of several types. Uh, which are obviously mostly research and stuff, but the chemistry, the biochemistry, to get people to go into these fields of science. Um, I go to these, uh, it was just at the Democratic uh, State Convention, and I can't believe the number of political science people that, that are looking to work on campaigns and things. I can't find anybody doing math, and, well, not, not, not everybody, but very few. And these are the things I think we need a concerted effort and more money for. So I put a plug in for that. And thank you again. Sure. John. John, John Watson, ask your question. Uh, I'm interested in the last mile problem in Fallbrook uh, and the, the connection of Fallbrook with the rest of the county. Uh, your 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 the detail in your presentation was outstanding, but I, I think we have a different problem in Fallbrook. You have all these little windy roads, country roads, that you take your life into your hands if you're going to do a bicycle. Uh, yeah, very many bicycle trips on them. So I I think we need to to look for the last mile problem in a spread out place like Fallbrook with maybe semi-rural or agricultural area. We need to look at something like on-call electric jitney system or something like that, so that the, a, the disabled and the seniors and the people that can't drive or won't drive and don't have money to do all that, we could have some kind of system that they can carry themselves around the city to do their grocery shop or go to the okay. doctor. And then if they want to go down to San Diego, they got to get to a place where the, they get rapid transportation into the city. Yeah, that's a very good we point. Got a little bit different. It's a very good point, John. One thing that I noticed um, when I do study, how did some of the cities that are very uh, progressive in their use of the bicycle, how did they get there? Um, and it's interesting because, you know, Amsterdam is often held up as being the, the lead city for this. Um, but it was in the 70s, they were as car dependent as we were. Um, and they made some choices because of uh, deaths and fatalities they, they had between uh, vehicles and, you know, pedestrians or cyclists or just uh, car on car um, violence. And they, they recognized that they wanted to change things. And one of the things they come up with over the many years that they've been working on these strategies is to say, um, I'm going to give an example here of a road. I live off of Green Canyon Road, uh, which is considered an arterial for some people. And I've seen people drive down that road, even though it's a 35 mile per hour road, they drive down it at 50 miles per hour. They go around blind corners in the wrong lane. Um, they don't seem to have a lot of regard for the fact that there could be somebody else coming uh, the other way. Um, and, but what they, what they might do if we were in Amsterdam, for example, uh, and they said, well, how will we address this um, this road that's being abused by car drivers, it makes it very dangerous for the local traffic to walk on. We can't walk on Green Canyon. It's, it's dangerous. Um, the way that they might do that is they might subdivide the, the road. They might bisect it. So between uh, where I live uh, and, and Mission might be open. But if I try to go the other direction, I might hit a dead end that's permeable by a bike or by walking, but might not be permeable by a car. 
Um, and so what you do in that situation is I, in order for me to drive somewhere, I have my one way to drive is to go out to mission, which would be considered an arterial. Um, but for other folks that live on the other side of that barrier, they have to take a different way. And so that changes uh, what's what's considered to be a street that's for the people that live on that street, and it, it returns into the those people. And so the only people you have driving cars on those roads are the ones that live on those roads. Um, now, they've done that very successfully, um, kind of subdividing. Some of their, their uh, car streets are more for cars, but almost all of their streets are available to cars. It's just you don't bother using it unless you live on it. Um, and so that's a really good way of uh, lowering the car traffic on all but the arterials. Now, how do we handle Reshi? That's a different problem, right? Because that's a big arterial for us if we're trying to get out to Temecula or out, you know, to 395 to get somewhere. All of the, all of those things will require uh, convincing the powers that be, the, the uh, county, to make some serious changes in uh, di uh, the traffic direction and repaint the streets and make bike, bike paths and all the, the whole assorted set of construction that'd be required. And that, that's going to be hard to sell, uh, maybe even in Fallbrook, but probably even harder to sell on the county level because there are too many comp competitors for the same thing. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that one of the big benefits that we have um, in these times is that the electric bike has become a real ignition factor for people to get excited about, um, you know, a thing that they never thought they would. They, most most people in this country, they get to age 16 and they they hang up their bike because that now they've got access to a car and they need to use that car to get to work. And from that point on, they live their entire lives being car dependent rather than using their bikes for transportation. Um, but the e-bike is really going to change things as far as what it could allow us to do. And I'm hopeful that some people um, will step up and start to make that choice and we'll get a little bit of um, boost from the numbers of people that start to use these micro-mobility solutions. The more numbers that we have out there in the streets, not just using them for fitness or for uh, enjoyment and, and entertainment, but for getting somewhere. Uh, in our normal street clothes. And when we do that, we really send a signal to people, oh my gosh, a bicycle can be used to go someplace. It can be used for transportation. Uh, that's been the beauty of my uh, bamboo cargo bike. Nobody thinks that I'm exercising with that. They, they kind of get the sense that I'm on my way to someplace. Mark. Yes. So uh, I bought an electric bike last fall and I've been using it to get around Fallbrook. And I can say from my experience that the drivers in Fallbrook are very good about giving bikes space. I haven't had any trouble at all. I've got over 500 miles on it. I also bought an electric car recently, but I still ride the electric bike. And I get the, the idea that the electric bike has a much smaller carbon footprint than the car. So. When I, whenever I can ride the bike, I ride it and I really count on the fact that I'm getting some exercise too. Um, but as long, along with having the car, the, my form of transportation be low impact on the environment. You know, it's funny, I, I work with uh, Mark now at the San Diego Building Electrification Coalition, but the first time we met, it's because we noticed each other's bikes. Um, Mike's got, uh, sorry, Mark's got a, a bright yellow uh, e-bike that looks really snazzy. Um, and he looked at me on my rolling laundry basket and he had to ask me about it. So um, these, these bikes can be a, a good connector in our community too. Um, it's usually pretty often that we don't get to talk to other people in cars when we're driving. When you're on the bicycle level, um, you're much more uh, apt to speak to the person next to you when you're stopped at a light or uh, when you need help or when you need to ask for directions. And so um, it's community building to be using the smaller transportation too. Yes. Well, I, I, I really appreciate everyone uh, coming tonight and, and listening. Uh, I would uh, welcome your feedback. So when I send uh, forwarding information, I'll give you my email too. So if you've got any um, 
especially if you got negative feedback, I really want to hear that because I, I want to bring this to broader audiences over and over again. And it's really helpful for me to hear what, um, what, what maybe gave you the wrong impression or bad impression or made you feel like, mm, I don't like the way that you handle that. That's helpful for me to hear because I know that the things that I talk about um, can really put people in the defensive position. Um, and that, my goal is not to make people uh, tune out. I want, pe I want people to stay engaged with this topic. So um, anything you can tell me about the pros or cons about the presentation is really helpful to me. I appreciate it. Well, thanks to everybody for coming. And thank you, um, Carl, for your great presentation. And I'm not sure if John Cole is still here. I see you are. I want to retroactively thank you for your fantastic presentation last month. And if you, in case you didn't get to hear, there were over 400 views of the YouTube um, link. Oh. Wow, that's nice. So, and I hope yeah, that this presentation so, gets a similar number. Yeah, yeah. Very useful so, information. so we are getting a lot of YouTube views, even though it might not seem like that many people showing up for the actual presentation. There's several people are watching it later. So um, if nobody has any other questions, I think we'll call it a night. We went over a little bit, but it was worth it. It was a productive conversation. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody.